Dear Diary, today I took the first step, the first step in becoming an ADHD coach. I can't actually quite believe it. I want to learn, grow and build something extraordinary. I think this journey will be... Shh, the Indigo Diaries. Dear Diary, welcome world to the Indigo Diaries and welcome to our exciting new series, Series 2, The World Through a Trainee's Coach's Eyes. And that trainee coach is me, Tasha Hicklin. The Indigo Dares is a podcast for those who want to learn about ADHD through others' experiences. So welcome back, everyone. And uh, it's been a, a, a few weeks since we were last here, or since I was last here, and you were probably last here. The last few weeks have been uh, another few weeks of just absolute illness. We had, uh, we, I live in Malaysia and the air quality is really bad, but we, um, we had like, uh, because it's so hot at the minute and there's no rain, we had uh, fires um, in the bushes and I caused a lot of smoke in my house, which caused my asthma, I have quite severe asthma, so it caused my asthma to be all over the place. But actually the biggest thing for me is not actually the physical uh, uh, illness, but it's my emotions, kind of my mental. I can't have my outlets. I talked a few weeks ago about my outlets of exercise, but I just didn't get my outlets of anything. I was literally sat in bed for six days and oh, my emotional regulation was all over the place. And it's quite funny because actually we're actually talking about emotions today. But this week is the first week where I kind of have this sense of normality and this sense of my regular routine. And it's just, it really shows you that routine is really what keeps me structured i'm a very structured person i love routine um i'm not very uh spontaneous at all um so being ill is it really knocked me it really knocked me for a few weeks so i took last week off because uh i was recovering so i'm back and i'm really excited i i ate i was able to do my um to do my course and still carry on with all my reading and things so I was happy that I didn't get to actually miss anything so I'm back and we're a little bit behind now but I'm gonna spend the next few weeks kind of getting back into this because I really miss verbal processing with you so welcome back right enough about me because I'm looking at time so today is about strengths and qualities of people with ADHD and emotions which is a funny one because we just started with that so that's come at the right time it's almost like it was meant to be so the first thing is we're going to talk about strengths and the qualities. So strengths are things that we naturally do well. And that would include talents, characteristics, skills, passions, qualities, lots of different things. Something that we do easy and successful and something that we really enjoy. So I'm first going to talk about strengths and then I'll go into something else later. So we were learning, uh, we actually learned this on my other course as well. There's two different types of strengths, okay? There's performance and character strength how i look at this is human beings versus human doings human doings is your strengths your performance strengths things that you do and or what you're good at what you do and human beings is character strengths things of who we are strengths of what we are so i'm firstly going to talk about character strengths character strengths um absolutely changed my life uh, finding out about character strengths um, in a big way. Um, a really good resource to look at that we looked at in this course, but I looked at in the previous course is the VIA, the VIA. So that's V I A character strengths, and I put this in uh, in the links below. And this is really amazing, and it looks at there's a, bit, a lot of science behind it. They went to like different countries around the world and did these studies about um, actual character strengths of people. And there's 24 character strengths, okay? And they come in different capacities, okay? So every single person, human being, ADHD or not, has 24 character strengths. However, they appear in different people at different capacities. So some people have some character strengths that are higher than others. Some people have others, but everybody has a capacity to to have these as strengths. However, sometimes in different situations, different strengths come up. And it's really interesting. I actually did this uh, strength test a while ago, like a really long time ago. And then I did it recently. And my character strength recently came up completely different. And it was because I'm more self-aware now. So I was answering the questions as myself, not as what I thought 
I needed to do. So um, it's really amazing. So uh, they look at the top five to seven and they are called your signature strengths. So the real top five in the VR, they actually have um, different types of strengths, but I'm not really going to go into that. So my top strengths, my top five, they asked you to give your top five is creativity, fairness, curiosity, zest, and authenticity. And it was just, I, I just looked at them. And then my number six is gratitude and seven is hope. And I looked at them and then I looked at my values and this and this. And I was like, they are spot on. And it actually gave me, I think I always knew what my strengths were. But if someone said to me, what are your strengths? Like six months ago, I'd be like, uh, I don't know. I can tell you what I'm not good at. But I could never say what I was good at and who I was. And this really helped me. And I think I knew this because uh, we'll talk about values uh, later on. But I've been doing a lot with my coach about values, about real core values of what you believe and how you live your life and what you really value in your life. And these matched up with my five characters, uh, with my five core values. And these top five went straight in there. And I just couldn't believe it of how much self-aware I really am now. And this really, that these are, I have these written down, I have them on my wall to be like, when those bad days come, like, look what you have, look at who you are. And they ask the question is, can they compensate? Can your character strengths compensate for the ADHD challenges? And I feel like when you know what your strengths are, then you know how to live your life. We've spent so long being hid away and not knowing what we're good at because we always look at the negative. We look at the things like hyperactivity, impulsivity, emotional regulations, executive function, so on, so on, so on. We don't actually look at the strengths of ADHD. Some people say superpowers or um, qualities or special things. I like the word strength. What are you good at? And I think they can help you live your life. So an example for me is like my creativity. So one of my biggest things with uh, myself is my working memory. So what I do now is I've given myself permission to put visuals up all over the place. So it helps me remember curiosity. I'm so great at learning but I wasn't learning in the right way. So I was curious and found a way that I can learn because I'm so curious. My zest, I always got told that I talk too much this and this and this, but I'm using it in my advantage. And it really shifts your perspective and it did mine. So for me, your strengths, you look at your things that you find hard and you use your strengths to help them. You use your strengths to work at your advantage. You use your strengths to knock down that wall, cross that bridge of barriers. You knock down the barriers and you work and you use your life using your strengths. And for me, this, this just highlighted everything that I already knew because I did it on my other course, but just how important they are. And this is about human beings. We're not human doers. Human doers, performance strength is important. But who you are, for me, is so much more important than what we do. And society has us so much looking on what we do. And I love that this course, yet again, highlighted that. Then they talked about talent. So talent is your natural ability. And if you foster it and add skills, then it becomes a strength. And that becomes a performance strength. So then they asked, what are some of your talents? And I remember back in the day when I had to do this for my other course, I was like, um, um, uh, I'm not really good at anything. Everyone's great at stuff. And you really got to, I asked my family, I looked at, I asked my friends, I looked at um, evidence in my life, knowings, memories, and things that my successes that I've done. And I found some, I wish we could share them with you. Mine is number one is communication my communication skills. Number two is musical rhythm. Number three is imagination, divergent thinking. Number four is emotional intelligence. Number five is logical thinking structure. Um, and the next one is being highly sensitive. I think that's a natural talent for me and being empathetic. And then I've used them in skills 
So I've used my musical rhythm to build skills like singing, performing arts. I've used my things like logical thinking, my planning, to do things like my organisation and the way I run my life and structure. I've used things like my um, imagination to create out-of-the-box structures. And it was really amazing to see that, wow, I actually have talents. And then they asked, have you discovered any as an adult uh, um, and you've actually realised them? You didn't realise them as a child, but you realised them as an adult. And I was like, yes, all of them. I don't feel like I ever saw myself in a positive light and in a strengths light to be able to actually see my talents. I used to think, yeah, I'm quite good at singing. Yeah, I'm quite good at rhythm. Yeah, I'm quite good at planning. I'm quite good at this. But I never actually said, you know what? This is a natural talent. This is what I am good at. This is what I was born with. And I really feel like um, I've given myself permission to look at that because I'm looking out of eyes of strengths. Not every day. Some days, I, there's no way. When I was ill, there was no way you, I could have told you any of my strengths. But 80% of the time, I'm looking throughout my eyes of strength. And that's because I've given myself permission to do this. And we'll talk about more like this later. So the next part of this was interests. Okay, so an interest holds our attention and passions. And then the passion is the emotion that fuels things to why we're interested. And... There was, you know, people say that ADHD is a deficit of attention, but there's been a lot of talk recently about ADHD is actually, well, I don't like the word deficit, but ADHD is a challenge of attention, of interest, not attention, interest. Because if we're interested in something, we get absorbed in it. As people may know the term hyperfocus. If we're bored in it, yes, then our attention does go. We can't regulate our attention when the interest is involved and they said what sort of interests absorb you so mine is things like planning scheduling i love it i get such a high off it mine also is working with children um exercise music and i could go on and on and what these things absorb me, things to do with ADHD, I've got that like ADHD mad, mad brain. Anything to do with ADHD, I can just do for hours. And all these different things that interest you can absorb you. So minds are oh, loads of different things. So they said, how might some people with ADHD use their interests as an advantage? Well, what people can do is use their interests to create things. So for instance, I hate paperwork. It is the worst thing in the whole world. But I like planning and structure. So I try and bring my, I like creating planning and structure. I don't like following planning and structure. So for instance, this year in my job, I had to do a lot of structure. I have to do a lot of paperwork in my day-to-day -day job. So I just made my own systems. I used my creative brain to think out of the box, use my imagination, which is one of my strengths, creativity, which is who I am, my character strength. And I was interested in it and I created all my own systems that work for me. So when I do things like my paperwork and things like that, because they're my own systems, I am more interested. So they absorb me more when it comes to things like exercise. I wasn't finding the right exercise, but exercise really interests me. So what I did was I used that interest and I, um, I found some exercise that really motivate i like high intensity so i found boxing and now i'm interested so it keeps me there and i do it it motivates me and i really think it's that finding what you're interested at to absorb you to absorb your attention and i think a lot of us we don't give ourselves permission to go through our interests if you're interested in you're going to sit there and it's such a big part of getting someone's attention with ADHD and it's something that I, I found, feel that is not talked about enough. The last one for this half anyway, is what are you passionate about? Finding your passions, that thing that drives you, that emotion that drives you, that fuels your interests. So what are you passionate about? Making a difference, 100%. Making a difference, equality, in lives 
I'm passionate about giving everything my all. I'm passionate about making a difference in children's lives so that people don't grow up the same as me. That's probably one of my biggest passion in my life. Another big passion in my life is my family, my pets, my home, my daily life, myself. I have lots of different passions. And when I'm living through my passions, it drives my interests. If I'm not living with my passions, which is my heart, I find it hard because my emotions, I'm very emotionally driven, which we're going to go into after the break. And so that's really hard. So they say, why do we look at things from ADHD, with ADHD as strengths? Because if you look at the weaknesses of ADHD, if you go online and you put in ADHD, it's deficit of attention, this, 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 this. They don't talk about the strengths. And it's really it really does change your perspective of the strengths that we possess, the strengths that we are. And everybody with ADHD is 100% different. Everybody in the world is 100% different. But there is some sort of intensity when it comes to people with ADHD and their strengths that just have that, that extra bit. And when you look at ADHD through strengths, it opens your eyes, it changes your perspective, and you start giving yourself permission to live your life to your full potential. Because I know it did mine. So I'm gonna end there, we're gonna have a break. I've actually remembered, that was all big topic. And we're going to come back where we're going to talk about emotions, which is a real big one for me. Probably the biggest topic for me. So join us after the break. I really hope you do. And we're out. If you would like any information on Indigo's support group, check out the website below for our link to our Facebook page or email at indigo.adhd2020 at gmail.com If you would like to offer any comments or feedback or if you are interested in the world hearing your story then please reach out either through the group or through our email As said before, have a good week Check in again later, Indigos. Shh, the Indigo Diaries. And we're back, finally, on my agenda. I have a little agenda because that's who I am. I can't remember all this. So I have a little agenda and I keep writing break in like capital red letters. So I'm really happy I took a break. So we're back. And in the first half, we talked a lot about strengths and talents and qualities and different types of strengths and things. This time we're gonna go into emotions. Now, this is a huge topic for, let's say, 15 minutes. However, I'm gonna do my best to try and cover as much as I can. So let's get started, hey? So emotions for with ADHD are not in the DSM-5. So the DSM-5, if, you, um, if you're not aware, is the Diagnostic Criteria Manual. Um, and it's, it's not in there for emotions. And not many people actually for a long time were focused on ADHD and emotions. And I know for so many people that I've spoke to, that I've listened to, that I've experienced, and for myself, it is one of the biggest challenges with ADHD. And even if that is from the cause of ADHD, and how our brain wiring works, or the impact of living your life with ADHD, it's a bit of both. And one of the things that they did on this course, and they they did this question, what does ADHD feel like to you? And I was like, wow, that's a loaded question. That's a loaded question. How do you answer that? What does ADHD feel like? And I'm going to put a link below, which is a video about what ADHD feels like to some children. It's a really great video. I put it below. And they had they had about 30 different answers of people's opinions that they've got about how ADHD feels like to them. 
And I was reading all these words, slow, stupid, frustrating, misunderstood, alone, shame, anxious, self-conscious, cluttered, selfish, slow, lazy, battle, struggle. And I just cried. I showed my partner and uh, he was like, wow. It, it has many strengths, which we talked about in the first uh, part, but it also has many, many, many downs. And this half is going to be a bit more, a bit more of a different style to the first part. And it's a bit like a paradox of ADHD. We stretch and then this side. It's a bit like a paradox of ADHD, which is what ADHD is like anyway. Which, uh, that is a big analogy that's used a lot is the paradox. And that's a bit like this episode. So if you don't feel like you want to go into this, then that's okay. You can turn off. But I just wanted to give you that warning. So I'm going to carry on. So I sat there and I was like, okay, what does ADHD feel like? And I was like, I can't answer that. I don't, I, how do you put that into words? How do you articulate that? I know what it feels like. I live with it every day. But how do you articulate that into words? I really struggle getting my, what I think into words sometimes. I'm very good at communicating with people and knowing what to say. But when it comes to my own views and my own point of view, sometimes it's hard to articulate. So I came up with this. ADHD to me, is like a constant roller coaster. Many ups and many, many downs. The battles of up to down are so rapid that sometimes you feel someone is controlling your roller coaster. And that roller coaster is your life. However, without those downs, how would you ever pick yourself up to have those amazing moments? And that's what ADHD feels like to me. Many ups, many downs, many rounds, many rounds like this. But without those downs, you wouldn't go back up. And that's what it feels like to me. So if you're at home, think about what it might feel like to you. It's hard. But there are ups and there are downs. So getting back to emotions, everybody has feelings. Everyone in the whole world, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, everybody has feelings and emotionalities. However, individuals who have ADHD have it to a more ex extent, have it more intense. The word is intense. And we have less control of how to regulate them. So this comes back to what we talked about last couple of weeks ago about it with uh, executive functions, that big emotion, but also the self-regulation. And this is why I cannot understand it's not in the DSM-5. But that's another story. And that's a, that's a whole other whirlwind of a story. So the big thing that, they, we, that we hear so many different terms, RSD, emotional dysregulation. So I'm going to use emotional dysregulation. And it's a really a huge topic. And they asked this question, it's just another loaded question. What are your experiences with ADHD emotionality? And I was like, where do you want me to begin? I just sat there and I was like, where do you want me to begin? When I was young, the biggest thing for me was anger, shame, and guilt. The anger that I couldn't, I couldn't, understand how I could go one second from being hi the best the best day ever to the worst day ever and I couldn't control it it was like my brain just shut down and this thing would come over you know I got told when I was younger I had an anger problem because I, I I'm gonna admit I have I used to have real bad flash anger where I couldn't control it and I would punch a wall and then the shame hit here we go again here you go Tash why are you doing this? It's not normal. It's not right. And the shame and guilt of not being in, not being able to control yourself, not being able to sit and read, not being able to sit down for 10 minutes without having to need like you get up. 
not being able to stop your brain, being so exhausted, you can't get up out of bed. And for me, like, it was the fact that I couldn't understand my brain. I couldn't understand what was going on. And it was that I was different. And it was so intense. And I still struggle with these now and, you know, in as much control as I like. But for me, it was the masking, the imposter syndrome, everything. Emotions was one of the biggest things for me as a child and, and as an adult. And, but for me, the biggest one was anger. I really struggled with my anger and then the guilt of being angry. And I could literally talk for about 25 minutes, 25 hours about this, but I'm not going to because like we said before, we don't really have that long. And it is really sad that the intensity of your brain and because we can't self-regulate ourselves as, as fast that our emotions do go all over the place. And then it's, it's that guilt and the shame of kind of being who you are. And they gave examples that anger, loneliness, shame, guilt, and RSD. RSD deserves its own whole episode. RSD, if you don't know, is rejection sensitive dysphoria. And that means basically we, we feel rejected and it, it, it can either be perceived or it can be reality or it can be perceived. We perceive something, we, we create this narrative in our mind and we feel rejected. And the pain of that is just absolutely horrendous. And this is a, basically a new term from William Dodson, but it's such a huge part of ADHD. And one of the main things I see here is RSD, RSD, RSD. And it's a huge part that, like I said before, is, is, uh, is it's not in the DSM-5, it's not recognized, but it's really starting to come. People are really starting to acknowledge the emotions in ADHD, which is fantastic because it really is such a huge part you know, it's, you know, the impacts is, you know, the shame of being who you are, not being diagnosed, being different, all these external behaviors that you sometimes you can't control, that you can't regulate. And then the past. The past is a huge one. And they start to talk about, they started to talk about the grief process. So grief was another one. And the, the grief process most people go through with ADHD when they're first diagnosed. So the grief process is uh, Kubler-Ross. I've put it in the link below. And basically it's a denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And they say that we're grieving for the life that we could have had, we should have had, and we wanted to have. You have to grieve for the life, the child that you could have been. Grieve for the life you could have had and that you probably wanted to have. Grieve for all those struggles. Grieve for all, all those moments in your life where you thought that you weren't worthwhile. And they don't also don't really talk about this. When you diagnose, it's here you go. And this really hit home for me because when I, I don't really think I went through when I was diagnosed. I, I didn't think about it for like two months. <laughs> so that's the denial. And then the anger started. The anger towards my family, the anger towards people, the anger towards all the external things about my past, who I was. Then the bargaining where you start to, that's the real game changer, where you start to reframe. But then as you're starting, the depression comes and you just feel really depressed about it. And then you ex finally is that acceptance. And I think most people go through this. Some people go through this, it takes years. Some people, for me, I would say this kind of took six months. And even within them, sometimes I thought I've accepted myself, but then I would feel depressed or anger. And we have to allow ourselves to go through this, to grieve. If you've been not diagnosed for so many years, but even as a child, to grieve. Maybe not for the life that you should have had, 
because now I wouldn't change my brain. I wouldn't change my life. But grieve for how much probably easier it would have been to know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I think that's a real big key. So if you've not looked into that, have a look down below. It's, uh, it really opened my eyes. And then after that, what do we get? When we get acceptance, we get two things, hope and courage. And that is the turning point, the shift. The shift, the turning point, the perspective changes. And that's when you get change. That's when the change starts to happen. When you have hope and you courage to go out of your comfort zone, to go from what you've known, to start rebuilding your life, is a real game changer. And man, life's hard. It's hard. And emotions are, are they impact so much of every day. And to live a life with ADHD and not know just adds on even more. Even more than our natural brain wiring. So, wow, that was a... <laughs> I was ending on a very uh, hard note, but I really think it's important because when I was diagnosed, no one told me, no one spoke to me about this, the ADHD and the emotions. I was like, but it doesn't make sense because my anger, this, this, and this. And when I started to learn about this, I was like, oh my goodness, it's validation to be who you are. When you learn knowledge turns into action and action is power and you need hope and courage to pull you out of that grief so if you wherever you are in your journey of adhd remember hope and you are so courageous living your life every day please i really hope that you know that so next week is adhd across the lifespan now that's a real good one and treatment options we're going to discuss the different treatment options i just want to say that i know um, these, you know, these topics deserve their own episodes. And one day when I'm a coach, I hope to do that. When I come back for series three, oh, spoiler alert. When I'm a coach, we will start to do things like that. But just this is training. I need to verbal process this. And I want to give you a little taste of what things are in short time. But we're going on to 30 minutes. So I'm going to end with our encouragement of the week. Encouragement of the week is a bit of a long one, but it's one of my favorites is warrior. Be a warrior, fight for what you believe in and never ever hold back. Fiercely go towards your dreams with boldness and lust. Hold your ground in the face of conflict. Knock barriers down with courage and grace. Do not give up when you find yourself face to face to an obstacle. Instead, continue forward with abandon. Keep the fire in your heart burning strong and do not ever let your flame fade away. Remember yourself and what you're fighting for is worth it. And remember that you will overcome everything that comes your way. Because my beautiful friend, you are a warrior. Nikki Benaz. I love that. So warriors, I hope you have an amazing week and i hope you come back thank you for verbal processing with me yet again come back next week fingers crossed i'm not ill learn listen and experience the world through the eyes of a coach in training why not what have we got to lose hey go and have one kick-ass week warriors and we're out dear diary as the training process goes on It makes me stop and wonder, could there be more for us? More light, more possibilities, and a place where we can truly be ourselves. I think this journey will be 